Hi everyone, um, my name is Rachel Bussard. Uh, I am one of the co-chairs, as Betsy said, of the Educational Programming Committee. And with me is the other uh, Sesson Shepherd, uh, Bill Muldrow. Um, we're really excited to welcome you to um, the Virtual Archives Crawl. Um, uh, in just a minute, I will be um, introducing all of our tour guides for today. Um, so this is each, uh, so the way this is gonna work is um, each group of guides is going to have 15 minutes to um, uh, give us their tour. And then um, basically like any other session, um, you'll be able to put your uh, questions in the Q&A box and we will get to those in the about the last 15 minutes. Um, I don't think I've missed anything, have I though? Good. All right. So today our tour guides are from the University of Dayton, uh, Christina Schultz, the university archivist. Christina is a graduate of Miami University and received her Master of Arts degree in public history at Wright State University. After spending over 15 years as museum archivist, Christina moved into academic archives in 2013. One of her favorite things about her work is uncovering stories with the many collections at UD and sharing them with the campus community. When not at work, Christina enjoys spending time with her husband, two daughters, two stepsons, and their goofy Labrador retriever, Farley. Post pandemic, Christina is looking forward to the traveling to, traveling to the beach. Uh, our next tour guide from UD is Amy Rowe Miller, Associate University Archivist. Amy has been the Associate University Archivist at UD since 2018. Prior to coming to UD, she worked at the Ohio History Connection in their local history services department, managing their AmeriCorps program. Her current projects include managing UD's memorabilia collection, processing university records, and researching university history. Our next group of guides is from Miami University. Uh, first, we have Candace Pine, the visiting manuscript librarian. Candace is the visiting manuscript librarian at Miami University. She earned her bachelor's degree in creative writing from Western Michigan University, and she holds a master of library and information science from Kent State. Her primary career interests lie in processing, arranging, and describing archival collections and in cataloging rare books. Our next uh, guide from Miami University is Rachel Makarowski, the Special Collections Librarian. Rachel is the Special, Collection Libra Special Collections Librarian. She graduated from IU Bloomington with an MLS specializing in rare book and manuscript librarianship. She also currently serves as co-chair of the Special Collections and Archives Interest Group of ALAO. Our final guide for today um, from the Henry R. Winkler Center for the History of the Health Professions at the University of Cincinnati is Gino Posse, the archivist and curator. For the past, for the last five years, Gino served as the archivist and curator at the Henry R. Winkler Center for the History and Health Professions at the University of Cincinnati. Prior to that, he was an archivist at Wright State University Special Collections and Archives. His most recent work in as in the SOA was as the editor of the Ohio Archivist from 2016 to 2018. All right. Um, and with that, I will turn it to the University of Dayton. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today on our highlights tour. Um, we have a quick tour um, that introduces you to the breadth of our collections. Um, University Archives and Special Collections is responsible not only um, for collecting and preserving university records and university history, um, but we also have a really cool, significant rare book collection, um, and we have some special collections uh, from people connected with the university. Anything I forgot, Christina? No, you did a great job. <laughs> All right, so uh, you will see some of our really cool stuff as soon as I share my screen. And hopefully this goes smoothly. I've been practicing for this all morning. 
And there we go. Okay. The University of Dayton's archives chronicle its development into a top Catholic and Marianist institution of higher learning. Materials date from 1850, when St. Mary's Institute was founded as a grammar school for boys to the present. The first class of students at St. Mary's Institute included eight boys from the Dayton area. UD's archives include records created by university departments, records of student organizations, alumni and faculty papers, student theses and dissertations, photographs and audiovisual recordings, and university publications. St. Mary's Institute changed its name to the University of Dayton in July of 1920. The Board of Trustees felt this change was opportune and advisable and reflected the mutual respect and support between the university and the city. Athletics have been an important part of UD since 1903 when it fielded its first basketball team. Athletics records and memorabilia are some of our most used collections. Although it's now known as a basketball school, in the first half of the 20th century, football was the celebrated UD sport. Our collections document the team's fierce rivalries with schools from around Southwest Ohio, as these tickets from early games with Miami and Xavier show. The football team even inspired fan art. One of the coolest pieces from our memorabilia collection is this fan created statue of a UD football team and UD's legendary football coach, Harry Bojan. In the 1940s, UD began its rise as a basketball power and we have programs, press books, and scorebooks that document it all. UD basketball had one of its brightest decades during the 1960s. They won the NIT twice in 1962 and 1968, were the NCAA runner-up in 1967, and were in the NCAA Sweet 16 two other times. One of UD basketball's most iconic moments came in the 1967 National Championship game where Dan Obervac won the tip against UCLA's Lou Alcindor, who is now known as Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. This moment was captured on film and is one of the most legendary photographs in our collections. Women's athletics also has a long history at UD. Women have played sports for as long as they have been on campus, at first as part of the Women's Athletic Association. WAA patches like this one are a part of women's history documented through our memorabilia collection. UD was one of the first schools to elevate women's sports to varsity status in 1968, and field hockey was one of the first varsity sports for women. Women were first admitted to UD as full-time day students in 1935, and 31 women joined the first class in the new College of Women. The student publications collections document the changes that women brought to campus. One of our most treasured items is the scrapbook documenting the first four years of women on campus. It shows us both the academic and social life of these first women UD students. Some of these students even got to interview Eleanor Roosevelt when she came to Dayton and the scrapbook preserves her autograph along with that of Florence E. Allen one of the first women appointed to the federal bench. As records have become digital, so has our archiving. We continue to document the experiences of women on campus through digitally preserving things like this Women's Center newsletter. Special collections at UD highlight sports, the arts, politics, and the pursuit of UD alumni. These collections contain rare prints, drawings, photographs, maps, art objects, and audiovisual recordings. Here are just a few. The papers of humorist, writer, and UD alum Irma Bombeck document her career as a columnist and humorist. Irma Bombeck is known to many of the post-World War II generation through her syndicated columns on motherhood and family and her books on the same subject. Her collection contains original manuscripts, screenplays for her sitcom Maggie, 
the newspaper columns, correspondence, and photographs. The Charles Whalen Congressional Papers span the 1960s and 1970s. Whalen, a graduate of UD class of 1942, became involved in politics in the mid 1950s. He served six terms as a US congressman and headed up the liberal wing of the Republican Party. The correspondence in the Whalen Congressional Collection covers various topics, including the creation of the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, foreign policy, the Vietnam War, and the energy crisis. We have several special collections that focus on athletics, the Cy Burek Papers and the Miriam Jacobs Baseball Memorabilia Collection. Cy Burek was the sports editor for the Dayton Daily News for over 50 years. Known for his daily column titled Sighings, he was inducted into the National Sportscasters and Sports Writers Association Hall of Fame in 1985. His papers contain columns, correspondence, photographs, and sports memorabilia. The Miriam Jacobs Baseball Memorabilia Collection is one of our hidden gems. This collection of baseball cards, autographs, sports lit, baseball registers, annuals, and memorabilia showcases the history of baseball between the late 1860s and the mid-1960s. The Eclectic Rare Book Collection includes manuscripts as well as early and limited edition books. Highlights from our collection include many Bibles. One of these, Biblia Latina, is also known as the Coburger Bible. This 1485 Bible is an incunabula, or book printed prior to 1501. Printed by Anton Koberger in Nuremberg, this Bible is illustrated with woodcuts. Orizon is a beautiful illuminated manuscript dating to the beginning of the 15th century. Calligraphed in Gothic on thin vellum and bound in vellum, this manuscript contains 13 communion prayers 12 in French, and one in Latin. In 1969, surrealist artist Salvador Dali illustrated Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, the beloved 1865 children's tale by Lewis Carroll. This limited edition of 2,500 signed numbered copies contains 12 original woodcuts and one etching. University Archives and Special Collections is located in Albert Emanuel Hall near Resch Library. We are normally open to the public 9 to 4, Monday through Friday. Great. That is the end of our highlights tour. Um, we are happy to answer any questions you have at the end, but for now we're going to pass it over to Miami. Thanks so much, Amy and Christina. We're really excited to be able to share with you guys a short video tour um, of some of our spaces and also kind of highlighting a few of our key and favorite collections. Um, I think the video really says it all. It is kind of home video edition-esque, so please enjoy it. Hi everyone, welcome to the Walter and Happy Curse Special Collections and University Archives at Miami University's Libraries. We hope that to kind of give you a brief highlights tour of some of what we have, both with spaces and collections, and we look forward to seeing and answering all your questions at the end of the session. My name is Rachel Makarowski. I'm the Special Collections Librarian here at Miami University Libraries, and today I'm also joined by my colleague um, who will introduce herself. I'm Candice Pond. I'm the Visiting Manuscript Librarian here at Miami, and we're excited to show you what we've got, so let's get started. All right. Shall we go to the vault? Yes. Excellent. <laughs> All right. So now we're at the vault, which I'm really excited to show you guys. So this is not only one of our most secure areas with both an alarm panel and a biometric scanner, but we also have it both climate controlled and temperature controlled. Um, so we try to keep the temperature around 
anywhere between like 55 and 60 degrees Fahrenheit and then we try to keep the humidity at roughly 45%. But it's not enough to kind of show you guys the outside, so let's go inside for a second. <laughs> As you can see, sometimes it's very similar. <laughs> so we added the vault to kind of our spaces in around 2015 when we um, merged with the university archives. This was a huge ask that we actually managed to receive and we're really excited to be able to have kind of our best collections in here. So you can kind of see down the aisle just a little bit of what we have, including all of the multicolored uh, paper. Readers. Nick Guffey was a professor here at Miami University, um, and he actually was here when he first was tapped to make his readers. So we're really excited to be able to steward that collection. One of our best and brightest collection items, though, are our Shakespeare folios. So our first one was printed um, in 1623. It's kind of the most famous uh, Shakespeare book that people are familiar with by title alone, the first folio. So ours actually has a really interesting story. Um, it was donated to us by Dr. Otto O. Fisher, um, who is a Miami alumnus, class of 1909. And he was not only like so proud of his Miami background, but he also was an avid book collector. And these were some of the gems of his collection. And the story goes when he was purchasing them, um, he's at the auction. The first one comes up, he manages to buy it. It's from the set of Lord Lay. The second one comes up from that same collection. He purchases it. Now, this story kind of diverges a little bit for the third one, but the point is, he ended up actually missing the third folio from the set of Lord Lay. It went up to auction and he wasn't able to buy it, but he did manage to snag the fourth one. But he couldn't just have the first, second, and fourth folios. So he added to it um, a third folio from the collection of John Gribble, um, and you can actually see some of the physical differences. The first, second, and fourth folios that we have have this the same type of binding, including the blind stamping ornamentation surrounding it, the blind fillets, and then the only gold stamping on it is the title, the words first edition, and then the date, 1623. In comparison, the Gribble copy of the third folio is a little bit smaller. It has these gold stamped fillets and ornaments in the edges, a much more elaborate spine design, and a red leather inlay for the title, saying Shakespeare's works. We're really, we're really excited to be able to have these um, in our collection. They're one of our kind of top requested items, not only by patrons, but by students who just really love Shakespeare. So it's really encouraging and it really is a, an inspiration um, to a lot of the students here at Miami University. All right, now that we've kind of seen some of the gems of the vault, let's head back into the main stacks where most of the action tends to happen. Okay, welcome to the entrance to our main stacks here. Um, we've got our uh, security feature here. It's SS by swipe card only. Let's see what we've got. All right, first stop here. Um, one of the great collections that we have in, um, back here in our main stacks is our postcard collections. Now we have over 650,000 20th century postcards here in our collections. And the collections were started by uh, two, two friends from Miami University, um, Clyde Bowden and Charles Shields. Um, you'll find all of their postcards here um, in these 
uh, shelving units, and we have our um, digitization team uh, working on uh, digitizing all of these postcards and getting all of the relevant metadata put into our online digital collections, and they have been very useful to our students and researchers. Let's take a look. For example, here we have these all organized. Um, this is from the Shields collection, and we um, were organized alphabetically, Michigan through Minnesota. And so you'll see um, all the, the markers here for different locations like Mackinac Island or the Mackinac Bridge. Um, here we go, Petoskey, all in Michigan. Um, or sometimes they're by topic. We've got ones that have to do with fishing and logging, flowers. Um, so our staff and our students have done a really great job of getting these collections and postcards organized really well. All right. So let's keep on moving. We have another special spot just back here. cold storage. So we have got our cold storage unit here. This is where we keep um, photograph negatives, especially glass negatives. Um, There's a way to better protect those from deterioration um, or for things that are susceptible to things like vinegar syndrome, we will want to keep in here. So we keep the temperature at around 40 degrees and I believe the humidity level um, at around 40% too. All right, so we're just now coming out of cold storage, and one thing that I love pointing out to people as we're walking around is the fact that you can clearly see where the Walter Haverhurst Special Collections was and where the University Archives side begins after the 2015 renovation to kind of incorporate University Archives into the Walter Haverhurst Special Collections um, so that everything is kind of at the same site. So here on this side, as you can see, um, it's a lot of our rare book collections. We have over 90,000 um, collections currently in our catalog. Um, and we also have manuscripts towards the end that are special collections related, but we'll get back to that. <laughs> Meanwhile, on this side is our university archive side. And the reason why there's such a nice clear divide is that there actually used to be a wall right here, but as part of a that renovation, we managed to get this space as well. So we knocked down that wall and as a result, we have a nice clear path in between both the rare books and the archives. But while we're kind of near here, let me just point out one of my favorite collections. So during World War II, there was a professor here, William E. Smith who was determined to kind of help to document the everyday lived experiences of students here at Miami University while he was teaching um, and during World War II. He knew that this was going to be major for historians as a historian himself. So as a result, he assigned his students to keep a diary during his class. And the result of this is that we managed to have student diaries from a number of different students, a number of different perspectives that cover from 1942 all the way into the 1950s is when the last one ended. This kind of student project inspired another uh, history faculty member to do a similar type of project that would be Preston Beat Albright, but it also served as inspiration for us for the Documenting COVID-19 project, since we already have such a rich history of collecting student experiences um, during their times at Miami, especially during tumultuous eras and events. All right, let's go check out some of those manuscripts from special collections that I promised we'd get back to. So while I was back there and showing you guys the student diaries, I had mentioned that special collections has its own manuscript collections that are separate from the Miami University archives. And this is this has always been true since even before 2015, but I really want to point out one particular collection because it really speaks to the mission of Miami University to serve the student experience and student research, um, both at the undergraduate and graduate levels 
here in the libraries and also the wider university. So follow me. The collection that best epitomizes this mission is the Native American Women Playwright Archive. It includes some of the largest names in Native American playwright kind of history, both in present day. It includes Spider Woman Theater, for instance, Judy Lee Olivia, Larissa Fasthorse, just to name a few. But what's really special is kind of, in my opinion, is how this collection got started. And it got started by a graduate student who is asking a research question about Native American women playwrights. And the student couldn't find much. So what did they do? They went to the librarian. And the librarian at that time, Bill Wortman, he collaborated with special collections to help build this archive that not only filled in a gap in Miami's collections, but also as a world collection. So we're really excited to be able to have the chance to steward this collection, not just to our students, but also to researchers here at Miami and abroad. Welcome to our digitization lab. Um, thanks to the efforts of our digital collections librarian, Aaliyah LeVar Wagner, um, we have got this state-of-the-art digitization lab up and running. Um, they put a lot of thought into this room, so even down to the color of the paint on the walls, the way the ceiling tiles are painted, we've got blackout curtains here um, just to eliminate any extra light from getting into the room so we can get really great um, images. So we have our staff, of course, and our student workers come in here to work on our various digitization projects that we're working on, and then we'll also image things for our researchers and for classes. Um, we're really open to, to working with any of the departments in the university to give them the materials that they need. So we're very proud of this space. All right, get everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this tour of the Walter Haberker Special Collections and University Archives. We look forward to seeing you guys in the live Q&A session. Um, we just wanted to end briefly in front of our exhibition room. So as you can see, this is where our researchers actually will end up entering and kind of first seeing um, a bit of our collections through whatever exhibition is currently up. Today, it's currently actually staff favorites um, featuring a wide range and including the reasoning that a staff member likes it. So it's a great way for students in the time of COVID to not only get to see some of our objects, but also get to know our staff members a little bit more. Thanks once again. My name is Rachel. And I'm Candice. Thank you so much for joining us on our tour today. Feel free to reach out to us at any time with any questions or if you just want to come and see some of the great things we have in our collections. Yeah, and we will see you guys soon for questions and answers. Hello everybody, this is Gino Passi. Um, I am going to, uh, I don't really have a lot of comments and I'll let the video speak for itself because it's about 15 minutes. So I will hop right into it. I will say my 13 year old daughter did the video recording uh, and she did a phenomenal job. However, at the end, it does at times feel like a roller uh, coaster ride. So <laughs> you, you may need a Dramamine or something by the time this is over and done with. So let me see if I can get the video started. It worked before and hopefully uh, lightning will strike in the same place twice. Actually, hold on a sec. Um, I'm so sorry. I don't know what's happening and why this won't share. Can everyone hear me? Hey, Bill, it's Jenny. 
Um, or Bill, sorry, Gino, whatever. Um, sorry, it's late. <laughs> so when you hit share screen, um, does it let you select anything? Well, I, in the past, I just opened my, uh, I opened the video from my desktop, but now every time I do that, it automatically enlarges and my whole screen goes black. And I'm guessing it's just a, a file size type of issue. Why don't you, when that happens, can you hit escape and make it smaller? Um, I can't, but let me, let me give it a try again. So mm -hmm. I, I appreciate your patience. I'm so sorry. Okay. Okay, we're going to try. Okay. Repository for not just the history of the health profession. Got it, you know. Excellent. Yes, but also the history of the health sciences and health history in general. We uh, collect objects, we collect uh, instruments, uh, artifacts, documents, we have an archive. Um, primarily our collection emphasis is related to the city of Cincinnati and the surrounding area. But if you incorporate in that our over 45,000 rare and antiquarian books on almost any topic or subject in medical or health history, then that scope broadens to include uh, Europe and goes back to the early 1500s. Uh, I guess I should talk about the elephant in the room before we go any further. Um, about three or four days ago, I'm sitting in my office and I hear what sounds like a gunshot and I sheepishly look out my office door to find out that one of our windows has just decided to explode and shatter. So unfortunately today, what is normally a very pretty entrance is all boarded up and uh, looks somewhat ugly. So I apologize for that. Now, uh, before we enter, I should tell you that the Winkler Center is a part of the Donald C. Harrison Health Sciences Library. And we're in uh, the Medical Sciences Building on the University of Cincinnati's health campus. The Winkler Center is also on two floors as well. We're gonna start out on what's called the E-Level Winkler Center, and we'll do that right now. So follow me in here and we'll start out on the E-Level. Even though we're a part of the Health Sciences Library, we, uh, we have our own entrance, which we just came through. And when you enter the Winkler Center, you come into a small foyer a small uh, sort of a uh, desk behind us. My office is here. Being on two floors is somewhat of a challenge because although my office is here, almost everything else that we do takes place on the lower level. So that is a challenge sometimes. In this foyer, we usually have artifacts or some, uh, we have a book on display or a couple of books on display. We've had to move those though due to the window and for security reasons, but we've moved them into a room that is, um, in very high demand and in high use here at the Winkler Center, and that is the Stanley J. Lucas MD boardroom, or the Lucas boardroom for short. We use it for meetings. Uh, it's used by all of the health colleges, medicine, nursing, pharmacy, allied health. They all use this room for meetings, workshops, interviews, sort of public relations, um, videos that they do. It's very popular and, and uh, highly used. We like to allow people to use this for meetings because we have the opportunity to use it for exhibit space, which really promotes uh, what we do here at the Winkler Center. Uh, the exhibit that is currently in this has been in it since 2019, May of 2019. We haven't changed it just due to COVID. We've been shut down. But the current exhibit is on uh, the work of Daniel Drake. And maybe some of you Ohio historians know that Daniel Drake was the first person west of the Allegheny Mountains in 1805 to be awarded a medical diploma, which we'll see in a few minutes. And this also details some of his other work. He was the founder of the Medical College of Ohio here in Cincinnati, which really the University of Cincinnati traces its lineage back to by, by hook and by crook. Um, turning around, I'll point out uh, another sort of jewel in the crown of the Winkler Center. Uh, this is what's called our um, Cantigalli Apothecary. This is a permanent exhibit that we have here all the time. The Cantigalli family were um, 
pottery makers, terracotta pottery makers, majolica pottery, I, I think I'm pronouncing that right, in Florence, Italy. In the late 1800s, they became very successful at creating reproduction pottery. And what you're seeing here was a reproduction of a Renaissance era apothecary. It was created for the 1900 Paris World Exposition. That's where it was displayed for a couple of years. After the exposition was over, it uh, went back to Florence, where in the mid-1920s, a physiology professor from here at UC uh, saw it on vacation in Florence, he and his wife. They saw it in an art shop. They bought it lock, stock, and barrel, and donated it to the University of Cincinnati, where it has been since about 1927. So we're extremely uh, proud to have this collection. Each one of these jars is really a work of art in itself uh, and extremely valuable. I've, I've laid some stuff out on these tables. Uh, these are the items which are normally displayed on our foyer. Uh, I wanna point out one especially, which is really, again, another one of our uh, sort of great collections. It's called Mascagni's Most Splendid Anatomy. It's a book. It's an unbound book, an elephant portfolio. We're proud of this because there's really only about three or four copies of this in the United States, and, and we're lucky to have one. Mascagni uh, was a, a Northern Italian anatomist who, uh, like a lot of anatomists at, at that day and age, which is in the 1700s, was also a fairly good artist. He decided in the late 1700s that he was going to create um, a definitive work on anatomy, one that would rival or at least equal Andreas Vesalius's great work on anatomy from the Renaissance. So he set out um, doing these black and white line drawings of a six foot male specimen, stripped it from skin to skeleton, and did black and white line drawings of the muscular system, the skeletal system, the circulatory system. Unfortunately, he died before he could complete these drawings. So his family contracted with another person named Sarantoni, who completed the black and white line drawings and then did a color copy of each of those drawings as well. And he really achieved what he set out to do, Mascagni. This uh, most splendid anatomy, as it's called, is really um, seen as, as a, a crowning achievement in uh, anatomy works. I'll tell you what, now uh, I'd like to go downstairs to what's called the R-Level Winkler Center, but obviously we're gonna shut the uh, recording off and uh, we'll pick it up downstairs, so I'll meet you all there. Uh, hello again, we're on the R-Level Winkler Center now, and this is usually, I mean, this is the Health Sciences Library, which is usually full of people, but obviously, uh, again, this floor has been closed since uh, COVID about a year and a half ago. But uh, I digress. Let's go in to the R-Level Winkler Center and we'll take a look around there. So when you first come in downstairs, you're in what's called our Hauk Gallery. Now we use this Hauk Gallery space for a couple of different things. We've got some semi-permanent exhibits lining the walls on this side. We have a reading room over here. We've got a large research table in the back, and we've also got some other research space that I'll show you in just a few minutes. But first of all, regarding our exhibits, these are all exhibits made of some of the collections that we have, archival collections. I'll just point out a couple. Uh, this one over here is uh, for Albert Sabin. It's an exhibit on Albert Sabin, a small exhibit. Uh, Sabin, a little Ohio history here. Sabin invented the, or created, the oral polio vaccine, which really became in the early 1960s the go-to vaccine for um, stopping the spread of polio. Over here, and another, another wonderful collection we have, archival collection, is the Henry Heimlich uh, papers. Heimlich uh, was a professor of surgery here at the University of Cincinnati, but is probably most famous for creating uh, the Heimlich maneuver, which I'm sure you've all heard of. Over here, we have a small circulating section we have a Cincinnati medical history and health history section here and here. And over on the other side, we have a small reference collection. Most of our other monographs are back in the stacks, which I don't think I'm going to show you today because um, it's a mess, it's hideous, and I'm very embarrassed to show anyone our stacks. We'll leave it at that. But I did want to mention uh, upstairs, I talked about Daniel Drake being the first person west of the Alleghenies to receive a medical diploma. This is that diploma from 1805, um, given to him by his mentor and fellow doctor, William Goforth. Um, first diploma issued west of the Alleghenies. 
I do want to mention this collection because in our research, there is no other collection uh, like this in the United States. This is called the Daniel Young Civil War Drawings. Young was a surgeon in the Civil War. During battles or on the battlefield at his uh, field hospital, he would do a quick charcoal sketch or a quick pencil sketch of wounds or people you may have been working on. After the Civil War, he was going to write a book on Civil War medicine. Someone beat him to the punch. But for illustrations in his book, he had gone back and done uh, color copies of all of those old um, charcoal sketches or color recreations of those charcoal sketches. Again, we don't think that there's a collection like this anywhere in the U.S. We've all seen sepia daguerreotypes of the Civil War, but these types of drawings give, um, especially Civil War medicine, some color and some vibrancy. They're somewhat crude, but you can definitely tell he intended to use them as a teaching tool. We've got face lacerations, different types of wounds, entrance and exit wounds of bullets, so definitely one of them to be a teaching tool. Um, I've laid out just a couple examples from some of our archival collections. Uh, one, as I mentioned, the Albert Sabin papers. We have his professional and personal papers here. These are some of his research microscopic slides that uh, while he was working on polio. Uh, and we have a, a research, a laboratory notebook of his from 1956. And we have several laboratory notebooks of his. But this notebook is special in particular because it is the notebook in which he identifies the three strains of polio that will go into his future vaccine. We have the Robert Kehoe papers here at UC, and you might be wondering who Kehoe is. Kehoe was a uh, professor here uh, and really one of the founders of what's called occupational or environmental health. Um, he was a lead expert and a lead poisoning expert in the United States, and he was called upon frequently by Congress. Um, industry as well would all call upon Kehoe to add his expert opinion. Little Ohio trivia here. Robert Kehoe, um, his laboratory here at UC, called a Kettering Laboratory, was built by Charles F. Kettering up in Dayton, Ohio, and his corporation, the Ethel Corporation, which created leaded gas. They built his laboratory and hired Kehoe specifically to do lead-based testing because a lot of employees at the Ethel Corporation were coming down with cancer from being exposed to lead all the time. As I understand it, this Ethel Corporation building the laboratory here at UC and hiring Kehoe was the first private industry public university partnership in the country. We've got a, a great collection of, of what's called quackery, uh, sort of medical pseudoscience and, you know, medical cure-alls and uh, panaceas. It seemed like at the turn of the 20th century, uh, electricity was big in sort of quackery fields. They thought electricity was going to cure everything. If it hurt you, just give it a shock and that will probably heal you. I, I attend, a, I go see a chiropractor on a, you know, a weekly basis and he puts a little bit of electric shock on my back, feels good. But if you read this manual for the electroply here, it uh, purports to cure everything from hemorrhoids and prostate to obesity and baldness. And one other piece of quackery that I'll, I'll show you here, I find this interesting. When I first started here, not knowing what this was, I thought it was a breast pump for a nursing mother. Uh, made sense to me. It is a breast pump, but it is not for nursing, although I suppose it could be used for that. It is an early breast enlargement device. Now, there would be a device that attaches to this that would pump this, and it functions much like cupping. If you've ever seen people who have cupping therapy done on their back, it just creates suction. And use your imagination. I guess it leaves a welt or puffs you up or something, but if you're going out on the town 150 years ago, you wanted to um, enhance yourself, you would use this um, breast enlargement device. Um, I have to just say my, do my daughter is taking this video right now. She's helping me out today. And she is shaking her head and she is beet red that I just talked about that breast enlargement device. So I hope I haven't embarrassed anyone. Um, I could talk forever about some of the rest of the stuff on this table, but I will end it with this. I think this is very apropos of what's been happening over the last year. We have a lot of old um, 
in some instances, defunct hospitals and their record collections here at the Winkler Center. This is from the Cincinnati General Hospital, and it's from the fall of 1918. And why I pull this out is, I'm sure we all know, again, because of the last year, what has been what was happening in the fall of 1918, and that's, of course, the Spanish influenza. Page after page after page in this death ledger, and this is opened up to October 1918, specifically October 23rd, eight or nine people were, were passing each day because of uh, Spanish flu. And if you look, Faith, maybe you can come back in. I don't know if you can see this, but each one of these death registers says uh, cause of death, bronchopneumonia following influenza, bronchopneumonia following influenza, bronchopneumonia from the flu, bronchopneumonia, bronchopneumonia, bronchopneumonia. This is just on the 23rd, and that's six people who've died from the Spanish flu. So you realize, A, the severity and seriousness of public health epidemics and the importance of public health in general. Um, I think that's about it. I think I'm out of time. Again, I would love to show you our stacks. I know archivist nerds love to see stuff like that, but I am so terribly embarrassed of it. I, I can't put you through that, nor can I put myself through it. Folks, please come visit the Winkler Center, make an appointment, and I'll show you the stacks. I'll clean them up before you arrive. We'll make it nice and you'll enjoy yourself. Um, yeah, thanks for allowing us to do this. I hope you enjoyed this brief. Hi, this is Rachel again. Uh, thank you, everyone. That was amazing. Um, I wish that we could all be visiting archives in person right now, but um, thank you for all of those videos. Um, I don't think I could do one that as well as anyone did here. So, you know, great job. Um, so now uh, we'll open it up to questions. Um, and I have one in the chat from Bill. Um, to all the panelists, how do you see your archives as we start to open up to researchers uh, different from before or lots of the same? I said that in a funny way. Did that make sense? I'll go ahead and, and talk a little bit. Um, we have had um, some initial guidance from the University of Dayton that will be full capacity in the fall. So we have been by appointment um, since the beginning of August. So it will be nice to have people coming in and our instruction sessions have been remote. So we've, we've had to do everything online. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to being able to have people over here in groups larger than two people. <laughs> so our reading room is not very large. So when we do uh, tours with our instruction sessions, we can accommodate 10 to 12 students at a time. So um, we're looking forward to being able to get back to that. Um, we've learned some things through the pandemic that will, I think, inform uh, our operations going forward, just that we can do some things remotely. We can, um, we can do some remote, uh, oper we have do some remote opportunities, but anyway, I'll, I'll go ahead and turn it over to somebody else if they want to. Yeah, I can speak a little bit about Miami. So as we're looking to reopen, because we've been told that we should be kind of fully back in person by early July and anticipate all the students coming back in person. So we'll definitely be kind of returning to that normal or whatever that normal is going to actually look like. 
But there are so many things that we've started since the pandemic, such as we've moved our registration forms um, and our we created an online booking system for researcher appointments. I don't see those going away. Um, and I also don't see our ability to provide online instruction as well as in-person instruction going away anytime soon as well. So it's it's not going to completely stay the same. It's not going to be completely different. It's really going to be kind of whatever blend of both that works best for us in practice. At the Winkler Center, um, we never really stopped seeing researchers, um, even in the early days. But that said, I mean, even on a good day, we've never had more than like three researchers in our space at one time. So it's not something we've ever really had to worry about. We've even done some small tours for some classes and a small workshop for about six or seven students. And, you know, we'll, we'll continue that, that sort of thing. Um, we did start a webinar uh, that uh, sort of, I think every three months now we're doing uh, a lecture that used to take place only once a year physically. So now we're doing it sort of quarterly and um, online. We intend to keep that. And I should say, too, that the Winkler Center is open only by appoint appointment, but I'm there from eight to five every day. And so I always leave the obviously the lights are on and the doors are open. So we really got into a habit of people just popping in. And that was the normal. So one benefit, I would say, of shutting down over the pandemic is that we've really begun to focus back on being open by appointment only. So that that's been one good thing, which is much, much nicer. Okay, so we have a question for Gino in the Q&A from Anonymous. Dying to know, any thoughts on what caused the window to spontaneously break? Uh, I, I didn't have any thoughts on it, but the uh, maintenance people told me that tempered glass, uh, be mindful of this in your own spaces, tempered glass, which I guess is you know the way they make glass now for large buildings, has a tendency sometimes to just do this. Um, in fact, they put in a new building at UC, a new health sciences building last year, and they've, also, they've already lost like two large windows. So if you see your window spitting little pieces of glass for like a week, know that it will soon just shatter um, completely. Now, the good thing about tempered glass, when it does explode, it just kind of drops and doesn't shoot out. So if there's a silver lining, that's it. I guess you could say that's a silver lining. Um, does anybody have any other questions they want to add to the Q and A? I have a question for UD. Um, I used to work in congressional papers, and actually, I interned at UD when I was a student at Wright State, so I don't remember this. Are there in are there any hats in the Wayland papers? Because we had so many in ours at UH Manoa. Or like, what is there any kind of like uh, pieces of memorabilia that stand out to you? There are some campaign materials. I, I don't recall seeing any hats, um, but there are like some large placards that we have um, in the Wayland collection, so. Um, Nothing that really stands out. I think we have a JFK campaign hat. We do. That was part, like uh, when the JFK um, student union was built, they had a, I don't want to call it a museum, but they had a display of JFK memorabilia. I'm not sure who put it together, but the, the JFK campaign hat came from that. So I don't, it, it's not part of the, the whale and stuff. Um, thank you. Uh, there's another question in, it's for Miami University from Anonymous. Could you tell us a bit more about the biometric scanner to get into the vault? Does it malfunction, issues accessing that space during power outages or if the system is down? 
Yeah, so that's a really great question. We definitely have instances where the scanner itself has kind of been down in or out, which definitely limits our access. Um, but thankfully, our IT department is super on top of it when it comes to stuff like that, because they understand it's not just a matter of security, it's also a matter of access. Um, so we work with them really closely. And because we keep um, the vault on climate control, same with cold storage, um, when the like the backup generators tend to kind of keep it functioning while we experience a power outage and are waiting for um, the power companies to hop on that and fix it. So I hope that answers your question fully. Keep doing that. Okay, so we don't have any other questions. Um, if anybody has a quick one they want to ask, um, throw it in. Otherwise, um, we will close up for the day. See anything? Okay. Well, what's this in the chat? All right. Um, I don't see any more questions in the Q&A or any that were thrown into the chat. So I just want to uh, thank you again to all of our tour, gu tour guides. Um, this was really fun. Um, and I look forward to maybe doing this again in the future. Maybe we'll, we'll do it in person. Who knows? Um, so with that, um, I will um, be uh, going over a couple things for tomorrow. Uh, first, I want to th say thank you um, on behalf of the Educational Programming Committee to all of today's presenters, and we're looking forward to our presenters tomorrow. Um, so I would also like to um, thank um, all the members of the Educational Programming Committee this year, uh, Jolie Braun, Adam Wanter, Sherry Gowdy, Vic Fleischer, and Ann Reichboss, sorry, Ann, <laughs> and as well as our outgoing chair, Bill Madro. I'd also like to uh, welcome Ann Reichboss as our um, incoming co-chair next year. I'm excited to have her in that role. She's gonna be great. Um, another huge thank you again to uh, Dr. Betsy Hedler and everyone else at OHC for their support throughout this meeting. Um, truly would not be doing this, I think, without you, and definitely not as well. Um, so I just want to say um, we had a smaller um, educational programming committee uh, this year than we usually do, maybe about half as many. Um, so um, I really appreciate all of the work that everybody did. Um, and if you're interested in joining the EPC, we'd love to have you get in touch with uh, Bill or I, or um, you can also uh, let members of the council know as well, or express your interest on, in our conference form that'll be available at the end of the meeting tomorrow. Um, so with that, um, we will be reconvening tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, with our keynote from Ben Garcia, um, and he'll be presenting um, Archives, Libraries, Museums, uh, Meaning Making, and Magic. Um, so we will see everybody there, um, 9, 9, 9 a.m. sharp. <laughs>